the great tool I wanted to call out is what we call the Global Secure Access Connection Diagnostics tool. And as you can see here on the screen, it gives you super detailed information about the actual traffic handling. Um, and as you see from the example, so we'll log the, you know, if, if, if it is an FQDN-based traffic acquisition, we'll log the actual uh, FQDN acquisition. If, if it's called an NA, uh, not available, then it's an IP address-based acquisition. And you also see a source port, destination IP, destination port, protocol that's being used, the actual process, which is calling that, that's also very useful to have, like, is it Outlook, is it Edge, is it Chrome, like who is actually initiating the traffic? And then uh, we give you some more details of the actual traffic that's being sent, also later the, you know, the channel, which is handling the traffic and uh, for support so let's say in case you're getting really stuck and you can't get through or you you can't understand what's going on um then we have the correlation id so similar as you may be familiar with the sign-in log hello everyone and welcome to the 425 show. This show is for you IT pros out there or anyone that's interested in learning about Microsoft security products. Our team here, we have Mark, Bailey, Jeff, Jorge, and myself. And we join you every Wednesday to bring you great sessions about Microsoft security products. We host this, like I said, every Wednesday on live on LinkedIn. However, you can check out all our show shows on Twitch, YouTube, and um, all the different areas that you find shows that. Also, I forgot to mention Grace. Grace also comes to our show and does great sessions here. So for today's topic, it's a second segment about Microsoft's identity-centric security uh, service edge, or short for SSE. In this session, we're gonna go really, really deep. I mean, we're gonna tear apart the SSE solution that we have. And just as a quick reminder, we did a previous show about Microsoft SSE and be sure to check it out on our YouTube channel at aka.ms slash 425show slash YouTube. And thank you for liking and subscribing to our channel as always. So quick summary about what these solutions are, right? So for Microsoft's SSC solution, we do have Microsoft Inter Internet Access. It's a capability to extend conditional access to your network, modernize network security to protect users, apps, and resources. And we give you a capability to enhance security and visibility to your M365 access. For Entra private access, this capability helps you modernize pri private app access with an identity-centric zero trust network access. It helps you prevent breaches with adaptive access control and enhances security through granular app segmentations. For today, we have a special guest joining us, Thomas Denzer. He is a principal product manager in the identity network and access customer acceleration team us all the way from Germany to talk to us about ways to troubleshoot and debug the SSC product. We're going to go deep, as I said, but first, like and subscribe. And thank you for joining us, um, Thomas. Can you introduce yourself? And let's dive right in. Awesome. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, pleased to be here. And uh, thanks for having me on the show. Um, as Nick said, my name is Thomas. Uh, I am... I am uh, part of the Identity and Network Access um, product group. And um, yeah, I'm based in Germany, uh, Munich, so quite a bit away from you guys uh, where you host the show. And um, yeah, let's get let's get ready for digging deep and uh, dissecting the service. All right, a uh, little agenda. So I prepared um, a couple things for for you guys to uh, go over, and also feel free to raise any questions as usual in the chat. Mark and Nick will will watch the channel and happy to answer them as we go along. So we will start with a high level view of what the service is. So really high level, fifty thousand foot level view. Um, just to remind ourselves, like um, as Nick did in the intro, greatly, um, like what are the big building blocks. And then we're going to focus mainly on the client side because this is what you will be able to, um, you know, see most. <clears throat> excuse me, as a customer um, or as a consumer of of the SSE service or Microsoft Security Service Edge. And then we'll dive right into what are the tunnel and details because it's a question that we get quite a lot. Like, hey, tell us more about how the tunneling work. How does the authentication work? And then we'll look into how does traffic acquisition work? What are like the basics? What are the policy details? And then 
yeah, we'll we'll go even deeper. Like we'll look into all the nifty crafty details. We'll show a couple tools that you can use, uh, and then yeah, ultimately at the end we'll also look at some Wireshark traces. So with that, let's get started right into um, high-level architecture. Here's a picture of um, what the service is uh, built up for or built up of. Um, you can see here we have um, the clients. So we do support Windows, obviously. We do support Android, Mac OS, iOS. Eventually, we also support um, Linux as a client operating system. And then <clears throat> you see there are tunnels that are um, you know established from the client so there there is a client component uh, running on those uh, operating systems and uh, those tunnels are grpc tunnel i will talk about what grpc is in a bit and those tunnels then um, are connected to the to the global secure uh, service uh, global secure access service sorry uh, and um, <clears throat> as you can see, there are three main components. So one is the M365 tunneling endpoint, and then the internet access, as well as the private access. And we'll also see that in the policy details as we uh, look deeper. There's also a component, what we call the um, remote networks or branch. Sometimes you will hear us talking about a branch scenario. So that's really what if I have a you know a smaller branch or what if I have a network segment there when I cannot deploy the client, then we'll have something with a uh, CPE device or customer premise equipment, which essentially is a router, right? So it's a it's a router which then establish a IPsec site to site tunnel to the service. And that those endpoints then also talk to the M365 internet access tunnels. You see a dotted line here to the private access um, points at uh, endpoints. So that's on purpose for the branch scenario. That's not yet there. We're working on that, providing you guys that to the future. And on the right hand side, let's say exiting the big um, service block is um, also various uh, backend services to reach the actual um, workloads and applications are so starting with m365 and then on the internet access part and yeah everything else on the internet right um or any SaaS applications so those could be really any SaaS applications and similar to the private access part so the private access to the connector service so you need a connector deployed close to your private workloads <clears throat> but high level that's really how the architecture is made up And again, the different the key differentiation, which is you know always important for you to understand, like if you have issues that the client, like whenever there is an agent running, we have the gRPC tunnels versus in the branch scenario, we have the IPsec tunnels. So you know again, different tunneling technologies and different troubleshooting uh, technologies. Today's talk will be about the upper part here. So we'll talk about the gRPC based tunneling from the clients. If there is an interest from the audience uh, on the branch scenarios, let us know. We can uh, happily have another session on this. I would then also pull in a colleague from uh, our team uh, to help with that, um, but also happy to talk about all the IPsec-related stuff. All right, let's move on. Um, before we dive into, let's talk about some fundamentals. Um, so I <clears throat> mentioned a few times gRPC. What, what is gRPC? So not everybody may be <laughs> Excuse me, familiar with um, gRPC, I'm sorry. Uh, gRPC is a protocol that uh, was created uh, initially by Google. Um, and it's basically, as the name implies, it has the RPC part in it. And for those of you who are, uh, you know, in IT for, for some time, like me, like a dinosaur like me, you know, 20, 20 plus years ago, RPC were a really big thing is a way of inter-process communication. So how do you call from you know one process to another um, and uh, in, in a rather elegant way? Um, and also uh, there, was a, there was a need in let's say the 2008 to 2012 timeframe-ish uh, that you know, when REST APIs became a thing and you know, a lot of people you know, jumped on the REST API bandwagon, people realized that you know, from, a, from a pure networking point of view, the, you know, the efficiency on the wire is not that amazing. So um, that's why, you know, people like, <clears throat> you know, folks on, at Google looked into, okay, how can we make that, you know, more scalable, more performant? And then they came up with that. 
gRPC is a um, um, is initiative or project as part of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So it's really open standard. Here's a link, gRPC.io. It's a great you know, repository of how the protocol works, um, including code. So all the code of the <clears throat> various framework is on GitHub. Uh, so happy for you guys to have a deeper look. I spent quite a bit of time in, in, the, uh, in the repository in the last year and a half. So highly recommend if you're really interested in going deep, you know, have spent some time on learning about gRPC as well as maybe looking into the code there. Uh, yeah, I, I really love that, Thomas. I really love the fact that um, from the get-go, we're starting with gRPC being a standard-based model. So you basically, we're going to dive deep into the solution. And from the get-go, it's a standard-based approach. I, I love that. Absolutely, yeah, totally. And um, yeah, as um, as said, or I was about to touch on, it's a multi-platform, multi-language framework support. So, and that was also for us one of the drivers. As you know, we touch on the clients, right? We are not just supporting Windows, but we're supporting other operating systems. So, that was one of the drivers also for us to be multi-platform, multi-language uh, aware. Uh, and yeah, you see some names of companies using it: so Google, Square, Netflix, and other big companies. So. We're, um, you know, we'll be we'll be joining that um, you know team of of great companies. A uh, couple more things. Um, sorry, my voice is a little bit rough today. <laughs> so <laughs> that's okay. Need to need to go on mute. Uh, um, so gRPC is really a you know an extensible framework. Um, so it supports ten plus programming languages. Um, here is a few examples of code how that works. A key thing in gRPC is called protobuf. I don't want to go into those, you know, super deep details. It's really implementation details, but yeah, just just talking about, you know, we we use that quite heavily in the service. Um, and yeah, if you also want to play around that with your own client or service, there are a ton of examples out there. Many again, starting point gRPC.io. So now that we know what gRPC is and you know what the service is. Um, let's look into the specific of Windows. So, as I mentioned, we'll focus on Windows uh, today because you know otherwise we'll totally run out of time. We'll sp sit here for another five or six hours. <clears throat> but from a very high level building block point of view, um, this is how you know, the client is built up. Uh, we do have a kernel mode component which sits um, at the network layer. By no surprise, so for those of you who are familiar with the Windows network implementation, it's at the endless layer. And uh, we're um, hooking uh, very deeply into the endless layer to intercept the traffic. And then we have a couple of user mode components. Here's, again, like very high level building blocks. And the main purpose for those services are policy handling, traffic acquisition, traffic encryption, and then also um, establishing the gRPC connections to the various cloud endpoints. Now you also see here a couple of blocks here, registry, event log, ETW logging, or ETW tracing. Uh, if folks are interested in even more details, let us know, please. Uh, we can then have a look if we can maybe have another deeper dive session. But again, that's like, uh, you know, very, uh, another level 500, level uh, 600 type of session. So I wanted to leave it we as like that. that just Thomas, yeah. we, like, we like the deep stuff, so you know, keep it coming. Whatever you yeah. can explain to us, I think we like it. Good, good. Yeah, and also the like the our our viewers and listeners, yeah, please let us know, you know, what specifics because it's a big topic. ETW tracing again is more like you know, internally maybe, but also you know, we we do have a couple things that we can share also, and, and that you as a customer can use. Some of that does require some internal symbols that only Microsoft has access or support has access. But it's a thing for me, it's always um, you know good for you guys also to understand that in each of those layers, we have a lot of troubleshooting and, and logging capabilities, essentially. All right, let's move on a little bit deeper. Um, as I mentioned, a question that we hear a lot is like, hey, well, how, how does the tunneling actually work? So here's a flow chart uh, of uh, how the connection actually works. So let's walk through that. So the first thing that typically happens is a device, a client, tries to communicate with some resource. Here's an example as you know, an internet or let's say an M365 resource that say I um, wanted to uh, access my mailbox at outlook.office365.com. Uh, <clears throat> 
what the client agent then does, it intercepts the first, the very first IP packet that comes along and determine look by looking into the traffic acquisition policies, should I take care of that packet? Do I need to handle this network traffic? Yes or no? If so, then the client checks if there is an outer tunnel already present. So if there is a GRPC tunnel established at all. If not, it will try to establish that tunnel. Remember that picture from the beginning, like to the various endpoints, so that is dependent also on where we want to go. You know, between like we differentiate between M365, internet access, and private access. Um, if the tunnel is established, then, and if the you know if you're about to establish the the service enforces also authentication, so the user needs to authenticate, and then depending on how you configure that in your tenant, that means it could be either MFA or just you know um, standard uh, authentication. So all the richness that we have in in Enter ID, you can you can leverage there. So which is great. So you can do uh, additional enforcement already at the tunneling layer. That's also important to understand that the outer tunnel is also uh, strong or can be strongly authenticated. Once it is done, the, the client then receives an access token um, and then stores it locally for, for later reuse. Um, and then we have this concept of inner tunnel. So that is not something that we invented. That's actually a fundamental functionality of gRPC. So in gRPC, there is this concept of inner tunnels and uh, we will make use of that so the client then depending on the actual process that initiated the traffic will create um, multiple uh, inner tunnels and again authentication will happening there to the service once this inner tunnel is um, authenticated and established also the client stores that information so what tunnel is associated so that we can you know differentiate like which process or which traffic needs to go via which traffic all right, <clears throat> let's move on. How does traffic acquisition work in detail? So as I mentioned, so one of the first thing is we need to understand like, you know, should we take care of that traffic, right? Like is, is you know, Outlook um, allowed to, to send the traffic? Is the destination that we're trying to reach a part of our policies, yes or no? The starting point is always, and okay, so I'll probably switch very quickly into the portal because the animation unfortunately didn't come through. So the starting point is always the enter portal. So in the Global Secure Access Blade, uh, you will configure the various policies and the traffic policies. And here's an example. I enabled the M365 traffic profile. And on the, on the right-hand side, you can see what this means, like how does it translate into FQDNs and or IP address ranges? And you can also see the ports that are that are configured. And um, you know, by no surprise, most of them are 80 and 443. Um, and then also the action, what we are doing with that traffic. For the M365 profile, our recommendation is don't touch it. That's our stuff, right? Like we take care of the M365 configuration. For uh, the private access part and later for internet access, this is what you can configure, right? Like these are the traffic or the applications that you want to be handled by the service or not. So you have full flexibility on that. Um, <clears throat> going forward from a client point of view, uh, so once you have done that configuration on the service, it needs to somehow come or land on the client. Uh, and the way how we do that, there is a service on the clients called the Global Secure Access Policy Retriever Service, which talks to the backend and retrieves the policy. Here's an example um, where you can find it on Windows. It's in the registry. No big surprise. Like the registry is our main configuration database uh, on Windows still. And here as the path, you can also see HK Local Machine, Software, Microsoft, Global Secure Access Client. And the interesting part for you guys is the registry called forwarding profile. And we'll look into we'll look into that right away. So let me actually do that. Um, so let me share my screen. Yep. As you're bringing that up, do you mean just a quick summary? Obviously, you're talking about some of that traffic service stuff that you could see directly from the entry portal. I think that's very important. And like you, like you said, M365 and Microsoft configurations is we handle that everything else you can configure to your ability whether it's 
if you want to use port 80, port 443, those are the normal ones. And then we talk about some of that traffic acquisition. So let's dive in. Yeah, exactly. So as you can see, so we're in the intro portal. That's my uh, my test tenant. So I'm under the global secure access blade. And then i am go to the connect um, part and on the traffic forwarding, you will find exactly what I was just um, talking about, the, M the different profiles. Um, the M365 access profile, private access profile, and eventually will also light up very soon the internet access profile. And in under the you know traffic policies, when you click on the view part, then uh, you have these different components. I can, uh, for example, exchange online, we can dive right into, and here you see all the URLs and um, FQDNs, sorry, the FQDNs and the URLs, sorry. <laughs> that are part of that traffic profile. You also see IP address ranges typically, and you also see that on the client, how is it represented on the client? And as we just said, yeah, the, mainly the M365 profile, um, um, you know, shouldn't touch it um, because we, we take care of it. But for the private access part, so here's an example, I have um, a few uh, or two uh, test applications uh, for my private access profile. And, and you can also see how that's configured. Uh, yeah, if I click here, then we'll see you know the details, for example, in the network access properties. These are, you know, I have configured IP addresses uh, for port 445, which is SMB. But you can also um, configure FQDNs uh, or ranges here. So let me switch then to another program. So I will share. <clears throat> yep. As, as, as you're bringing that up, folks, I just want to remind you to like, subscribe, and thank you for doing that. One other thing I would like to remind you, ask your questions. This is a live show and a live segment. We're going to dive in. Your questions will help this session be beneficial to you. So go ahead, ask your questions. We're ready to answer them. Exactly. So uh, what you will see now is my test client here. So, yep. All right. So as I mentioned, so it's in the registry. And um, yep, by magic, I'm already landing at the right place. So uh, software Microsoft Colbo Secure Access Client. And as I said, the interesting part for us here is the forwarding profile, which is essentially a JSON. Um, what you can do, you know, copy it, save it to to a file, uh, look at, um, you know, a uh, JSON viewer of your choice. Um, I'll show at the end a little bit of an outlook, um, you know, what um, what that looks like um, or, or how we improve that. So there's a little teaser. Uh, you know, we'll, yeah, we'll that's it. awesome. Thomas, can you zoom in really quick? I think you're showing yeah, some really I'll, cool. Yeah, I'll move over to Visual Studio Code because then we'll see that much, much more clear. So let me, let me do Excellent. that right now. Excellent. And then we'll see that much clearer. Exactly. I, I love how deep we're going. We're going into like reg edit and now we're going to go to Visual Studio yeah. Code. I mean, there we go. yeah. All right, can you see that nicely or shall I zoom a bit more? It looks wonderful. Okay, perfect. So as I said, it's a JSON, um, it's a JSON configuration file. And uh, let's look at some key elements here. So the first thing you will notice is the tenant ID. So this is the, t uh, you know, the tenant ID of my tenant that I'm connecting to. So all of the configuration that we have is tenant specific. So it's also important to understand you know, the client will always connect to a specific tenant, authenticate to that tenant, and then pull the configuration from the tenant. Um, the key parts for us is the different profiles. And here you see, um, you know, there's an ID called, you know, N365, uh, which is, you know, what, what we just looked in the portal. Um, and part of each of the profile is what we call, you know, a primary edge and, and an edge address. And here you see, the uh, the actual endpoint location and that's you know in the current format is 10 idm 365clientglobalsecureaccessmicrosoftcom uh, That may change in the future, so you know don't put any automation built on that. You know, and that specific format we may change that uh, just as a as a heads up. But as of now uh, and probably until GA, that will be like that. But you know, the starting point is really the edge address. That's the outer tunnel. Remember, that's like, how do you build up the first tunnel um, uh, to reach the service? You can also see here the same for the private access, you know, similar format. Um, 
tenantly private.client.globalsecureaccess.microsoft.com. When we go further down, you see a bunch of rules, and this is actually the, the actual traffic. And you see the, the elements that I want to call out here. There are IPs, which could be IP address range. We'll, we'll have a look in, in a second. And then also FQDNs. And here you see a specific format. But essentially, it's like star.client.globalsecureaccess.microsoft.com. Or you know, further down, you will see you know, office traffic, of course. And then for the IP addresses, it's a, a bit of an interesting one. So it's actually a question for you, Nick. Like, what do you think that is? Start and end. The starting and ending of those IP addresses. I think that is tied to the subnet masks. I've yeah, pretty much, pretty much, yeah. So it's essentially, it's a decimal representation of an IP address. Mm -hmm. So IPv4 addresses all 32-bit numbers, right? So in 32-bit numbers, if you translate them like 192, 168, 0. whatever, <clears throat> translate into some decimal number. Um, so and if you do that, then unfortunately, I have to share another screen. So let me, let me quickly do that. I'll share yeah. my command line. Uh, I, I really I really like that this is almost a network segment, but it's very identity centric in a way that now we're talking about, okay, how does this look like, um, you know, how can you actually map identities to secure um, your your users? And then how do you map it to a network access control? I really, really like it. So, yeah. okay. Yeah. So here you see, I'm already, you know, used ping. It's a, it's a nice trick. Not many people are aware that you can actually use ping to translate those addresses. So, and you see ping will do a nice job on, you know, translating those IP addresses for you. Um, I'll show later, um, a better way of doing that. But, um, as of now, you know, if you, if you need to really quickly understand it, that's one way. Uh, but yeah, as I said, we'll, we'll have other tools, uh, later on. To, to share. I, I love that. That's a pro tip. So pro tip, you can yeah. use ping, ping to interpret. Yeah, and that's cool. I like that. Yeah. And Would that actually works also for v6 addresses. So if you have an IPv6 address in hexadecimal, for example, you can use the same thing. It will translate it for you in a um in a you know IPv6 nice address. One. Yeah, that's cool. Because that actually leads us to one of our viewers today asking about what about IPv6 for the data that we're working through. That's on the roadmap. So we will uh, we'll give uh, or we'll bring IPv6 support um, as of today. Um, it's not there just yet, but definitely you know uh, um, you know high high priority item for us on the roadmap. Great question. So let's dive in a little bit more. Um, at the end of the configuration, I wanted to call or sorry of the JSON file, you will you will see some configuration settings. Um, again, that's mainly, let's say, Microsoft internal stuff. One thing that I wanted to call out is this guy here is what we call host acquisition, in, host acquisition internal subnet. And we'll see that later on. Um, the trained eye, um, you know, um, you, we'll see that is a you new know, 6.6 uh, address. And the subnet mask is a slash 16. Um, Again, you know, I've looked into those numbers uh, too often, I guess. So, the, and and also aware of, of what it is, but that's something to be aware. So, we use that for you know any traffic you know um, that we need to acquire based on on FQDNs that we assign a specific IP address for that. So yeah. that hopefully gives you an idea of the main configuration elements. Again, the quick recap: it's in a registry, it's a JSON format. Um, you know, if you you really need to dive into really deep. This is where you could go. Again, quick reminder, we may change it at any point in time. So don't, please don't build any automation based on that format because yeah, that could change at any point in time. All right, so let's go back to the slides. All right, so let's move on. We looked into that traffic acquisition. Um, we also have API support, so if you want to, uh, configure your policy um, or get the forwarding profiles that we just looked at, right? Um, you can also call graph. Um, we also will have graphs API support for almost every configuration setting in the service. Also for the, um, you know, logging instances, for example. So that's a notion that you will see from any other service and, you know, the SSE or secure service is just no surprise uh, or uh, no 
no exception to that. <clears throat> Policy details we already looked into. Um, and then, yeah, we already just did the demo. I have these, these slides as a backup in case, you know, sharing wouldn't work. Um, so let's go into actual troubleshooting. So let's say, you know, you're at a customer or you're testing things out um, and, and things don't work, right? You know, it could happen. Yeah. Usually with, with the service, it doesn't happen. Like it was one of the, the nice things that we heard from our early, um, you know, POC testers is, Actually, it's very easy. Like you deploy the client, configure it, um, off you go. Um, but let's say if there are issues, um, what shall you do? The first thing, and I'll probably stick to the slides for now because the uh, we saw um, prior that the, the the screen sharing is maybe not as you know uh, detailed as uh, as the slides here. So the first thing um, you should always do. We have a little tool um, that we call the client checker that you should run which does as you see here a number of automated tests so let's say you know the client is not is not um, azure or hybrid um, azure dijon we'll flag that um, if any of the services is not running we'll flag that if the policy profile is not loaded or if, if it couldn't talk to our policy service then we'll flag that so really a lot of automated um, checks that are already ha um, happen or that that you know based on how we expect the service to run are being done. So that should be really your first uh, your first starting point. The next thing, let's assume you know everything works is fine. Um, then you know we highly recommend or highly recommend you look into the event log. So we have rich event logging support uh, in the client. Uh, here's um, here's the path how you get there. So it's under the application and service logs. Um, Microsoft under Windows, and then eventually this section is the Global Secure Access Client, and and you see we have two components. One is a you know operational log, which is on by default, and then a debug log, which you would need to enable um, manually. Uh, the operational log is something very very useful, and we'll look into a, a few examples um, in a, in a second. Um, is all about the connection handling. Like, could we establish a tunneling, right? Could we could we authenticate to the service? Can we retrieve the policy? Um, everything like from a, like information, like things work, you know, everything is good, is locked, as well as, oh, there was an error, right? Like we couldn't talk to the service there. We couldn't bring up the tunnel. Um, this, is, uh, this is in the uh, operational log. And the debug log is really, you know, as the log implies, like very detailed information about the actual traffic, um, uh, the actual traffic uh, details. Um, and I'll also show a tool how you can easily view that. But, and, and we also use that uh, for the tool to actually get to the data. So how does it look like? Um, here is an example, let me quickly pause in the water. Yeah, as you get water, I just wanted to say, hey, Antonio, great that you are me coming back to our show. Thanks for that. Um, talking about troubleshooting with connection diagnostics. I know it's brilliant, and I, I, I'm pretty sure Thomas appreciates that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. So what you see here um, are a few example events that I uh, pulled out. So for example, um, you know, we, we spent a bit of time talking about the, the tunnel, the outer channel. And here, you know, uh, as we touched on before, you see um, in, in, in this case uh, a success event. So the gRPC connection uh, established successfully. And we also call out where did we go. Uh, that, where did we go. Um, and also down there, we, we also indicate, hey, there was a change in the policy. So let's say you go to the portal, change something on your configuration. The client will then pull that configuration down so that it, uh, it is up to date and will log that um, uh, in the client event log. There are also events uh, where things fail. Um, I have actually a good example here. So let me try to go back and let's see if, if people can see that. It may be a little bit small, but let's see. Uh, let's give it a try. So let me bring it up. As you're bringing it up, I just want to remind folks, again, the pro tips that we've gotten so far, right? Use ping to interpret IPs. Use client checker tool for automated checks for the client. And then look into the event logs. And that's what we're kind of going through about the operation log and the debug logs. Um, so let's see how you bring this up and let's check some of it out. 
Yeah. So I filtered my log uh, currently for event ID 141. So 141 is um, I failed to connect to the edge. And let me make that, let's see if that's visible. So as you can see in the event log data, uh, we we specify what uh, what failed. Uh, we can't see that unfortunately here. But in the text you see here, a gRPC connection could not be established, and we also call out which channel does not connect. So it could be you know a problem with one of the endpoints, could be a problem with multiple, it could be a network problem. We'll uh, we'll see an example in a minute of a network problem. But that should give you a starting point. It's like hey, the tunnel didn't come up. We couldn't establish a connection. So let's. Let's double click on that. So why did we fail on that? Man. So while I do that, let me go back to the slides. Thomas, I really wonder now what IT organizations are gonna do. No one could blame the network team anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We'll, we'll highlight that. <laughs> so the next great tool I wanted to call out is what we call the Global Secure Access Connection Diagnostics tool. And as you can see here on the screen, it gives you super detailed information about the extra traffic handling. Um, and as you see from the example, so we'll log the, you know, if, if, if it is an FQDN based traffic acquisition, we'll log the actual uh, FQDN acquisition. If, if it's called an NA, uh, not available, then it's an IP address based acquisition. And you also see a source port, destination IP, destination port, protocol that's being used, the actual process, which is calling that. That's also very useful to have, right? Is it Outlook? Is it Edge? Is it Chrome? Like who is actually initiating the traffic? And then uh, we give you some more details of the actual traffic that's being sent. Also later, the, you know, the channel, which is handling the traffic. And uh, for support, so let's say in case you're getting really stuck and you can't get through or you, you can't understand what's going on, um, then we have the correlation ID. So similar as you may be familiar with the sign-in logs and intra ID, you also see correlation IDs, right? This is something that the support team will need. So uh, they will ask you for, for this package here. So really highly recommend um, the auto tab in that tool is the hostname acquisition. Here's an example um, of you know the the name translation that we do, and as um, as you see here, we are always using this what we call the synthetic IP address range, so six point six zero dot something, or you know generally speaking six point six slash sixteen. That's the subnet you will see for all of the traffic acquisition, um, and also that could be an indication, right? Like if you can resolve the name, uh, that could be an indication. Also. Highly recommend that that's always the starting point also for me is, is the traffic actually acquired, right? Like I configure something in the portal, look at my client connection doesn't work. First click step for me is looking into the tool here is like, is the traffic actually acquired? Like, right, is, is are we actually handling traffic? Going further, next thing, let's say something doesn't work. We also have an option for you guys, which is called record scenario. Um, so let's say you can reproduce the problem and then you wanted to send it either to help desk or look at this later. What we'll do, we'll, we'll collect, a, uh, collect a bunch of logs. You see here some examples like we, we for example, we, we also captured the forwarding profile, the JSON file, we'll, we'll collect some installation log files, the actual trace, like the ETL trace file, some registry files, the host file, as well as the event log. And then like either you can send it to us as you know from the Microsoft support team uh, so the folks look at, or you can use that on your own to, to dive in deeper. So I highly recommend to use that uh, record scenario. The other option is in the tray icon. So uh, right click on the tray and there is an option called collect logs. We'll do a similar thing. It's more a static thing, right? Like a static collection versus record scenario is Hey, I'm accessing, let's say, Outlook. Something fails, and we collect the logs for you automatically. <clears throat> so let's um, let's look what else we have. Oops, sorry. Um, what if all of that fails? Let's say you know we looked in one of the examples, right? We saw an event log. Oh, the tunnel doesn't come up. We got an error in the event log. The next thing you want to do maybe is look into the actual network trace and. Um, I done that before, so let me switch to my friend Wireshark and show you uh, how to do it. Or oh, before we do that, actually, let me go to 
the command line again to the shell. So remember, we looked at the at the policy before, um, and one of the things that I mentioned, like we look into the or the first thing that will happen is to create the outer channel, right? And in yep. this case, you know, we 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 saw that the private access channel didn't come up. So the first thing I wanted to know. What is the actual IP address that I'm supposed to connect to? In this case, you know, I did an NS lookup to that FQDN that we found in the policy, and um, you see here I get a you know a CNAME actually back, so it's a CNAME for you know ZTNA 3P ring MS Edge.net, and the IP address is 150 171 so on and so forth. What I do then? Let me then now really switch to Wireshark and. Go. We'll use that as a filter to to see what happened to that traffic. So where is my friend Wireshark? Oh yeah, here we go. <clears throat> so and as you can see here, oops. Um, I filtered for that IP address, and in this case, you know, that was after I fixed the error, actually. So what you can see, you know, my client is on the, the private IP, 192, 168, 188, 79, but reaching to that destination service. So we do a SUN, SUNAG, eventually a client hello, a server hello. And in the server hello, when you look at that uh, more detailed, you'll see the actual edge address, oops, down here, ZTNA bring one MS edge.net, right? Which we did see in the in the name resolution. So that's an indication. So in, in this case, this worked. I also had a case or you know a customer that that where the tunnel didn't come up. And what we did see, we did send out the SUNs, like TCP SUN, 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 no response. So what was the cause? So we 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 did speak to the network team. And you know there was a, a missing firewall rule, so the the client segments where the client was located was not allowed, you know, to talk to our endpoints. So we had to, um, you know, configure the firewall in this customer case to allow the network traffic to our edges. The next so thing this, I want. Yeah. So this case, it was actually the network's team's problem. So it okay. was I, well, the I firewall team. So you can say like network team. Yeah, firewall network team. firewall team. They all do the same thing. They, you know, but. You know, one thing I do want to call out as we switch over to the next segment for this presentation is the fact that there's so many tools that will get you the same results, right? So you're saying that it, with this solution, it already comes with, you know, Microsoft-centric tools as an example. But we just saw how you just use Wireshark to just trace the line and get almost the same kind of data. So you're making it very easy. And I think that's that's something that we can take away here. Yeah, absolutely. So the next thing is, let's say the outer tunnels comes up, right? And then uh, let's say we have a problem in the inner tunnels, like one of the workloads didn't work. And um, I actually had this uh, problem um, earlier today with um, one of the <clears throat> from one of my clients with um, with the service. And uh, what you can see here, so I did I did use the the client tracer, uh, sorry, the client diagnostics tool. And you see here, for example, I went to outlook.office.com. Uh, Office365.com, I get a synthetic IP, so uh, a 6.6.0.3 address. Um, and then I, I need to look into the tunnel, right? I want to understand, okay, what, what's happening uh, inside the tunnel? Um, what you can do there, ag again, you know, you can, or what I did is I created um, uh, a repo scenario. I captured the logs, as, as we showed before. And one of the nice things we'll do is we'll also collect the network capture that looks inside um, of the tunnel. So if you if you guys wanted to know more about it, that's maybe something we can spend for a later session. Is like how does that work? So we use a tool called Packet Monitor, um, which uh, which collects that. Um, but um, you know, once you have that trace, you can then also look into that. So let me share how that looks like uh, in that scenario. So let's bring that network capture up yep <clears throat> thomas as you're bringing that up i think we did get a question from antonio yeah um about is that an azure traffic manager address right i guess i don't know if it's the 6.6.0 maybe antonio you can give a little bit more clarity here but or maybe thomas you understand that question 
Yeah, so so we do uh, we do indeed uh, leverage um, Azure networking uh, in the background. Uh, so the the endpoint addresses that you saw in the profile, and also when when I did the NEM resolution for mm -hmm. the uh, endpoint, it does resolve to a unicast ring. So what we do is in Azure uh, in Azure networking, there's a concept of uh, of a unicast ring, which then makes for us the um, you know, traffic handling uh, quite a bit easier on a global scale, so that we don't have to care, worry about too much about you know so many IP addresses. So Azure networking takes care of that. So yes, we partner very very deeply with Azure networking. Yeah. Yep, I think that's so that was spot. great. Yeah. yeah, Antonio, if there's another clarifying question you wanted to ask, you could you could do that as well. But you know, Thomas, over to you. Yeah. So, um, so here's the the other trace that I took, and as you see here, I already filtered for that specific IP. So the inner tunnel IP address, so six point six point zero point three, um, and as you see here, you know, first thing obviously we do is sin. Um, the retransmission is something you know. Um, this is part of how we capture the traffic. So we're working on filtering that out going forward so but right now if you open that trace you know don't be confused about the retransmissions and um, that is uh, expected but as you see here also on the client hello so we did open the tls channel eventually and uh <coughs> excuse me um but, and you see already by the sni had also server name indication that we talked to uh, to outlook.com eventually the tls session established and as you can see here we do exchange data. Um, so the next step for that, um, you know, since it's still encrypted, right, I can't look inside the tunnel. The next step then is really, I need to take the correlation ID and need to work with engineering. So in such a scenario, the next click step is really you open a support case. But the nice thing is you can look inside the tunnel. So I also had uh, cases where I did see you know the traffic was initiated we did see again this tcp soon retransmission and the backend service didn't respond or came back with an error so that's also what i had like in the inner tunnel trace you can see the server was coming back with a 502 for example or 403 right and then you see oh that's actually something i need to look at the other server that has nothing to do either with the client or with the service so the tra traffic was acquired was sent to the tunnel but actually the, the backend server did generate an error in that case. One thing I wanted to also show you see that here in the header, you will see that interesting ethernet addresses. So that's also another indication that we handle the traffic. So that's something we may also again, change that in the future, but uh, something you know for the trained eye, people will probably spot that at some point when you look at that, and, you know, those ethernet addresses or um, something that we use uh, inside the client. So that's also something to be aware of. Right, let's go back to the slides. Um, and that, yeah, gives us almost to the back. So I think we're pretty well on time. Uh, some call to actions, of course. So if you haven't played around with Global Secure Access today, do that. You know, as you see, it's rather easy, enable it. You have rich troubleshooting capabilities to help you understand what's going on. Um, my recommendation is start with the M365 profile. You know, very easy to get started. Um, also, we see a lot of customers are very interested in private access. Um, you know, also really easy to get started, uh, deployed it uh, with the client, with a few test clients. You can scope it down really, really nicely to a few test clients, uh, install it, get your hands dirty, you know, log, you know, if, if things don't work, uh, use all the tools that we showed today. And if, you know, if you want to see more, you know, reach out to me. Uh, and and the team, we would love to hear your feedback and uh, want to know, you know, what what we should uh, what we should um, additionally build on that. Excellent, Th Thomas. Thank you so much for explaining all that. I mean, I have learned a ton today, and I'm sure our IT pros learned a ton just from listening to you. And hopefully, you like and subscribe the video, and you know, come back and listen to our future sessions. Uh, but before we go, I do want to remind everybody about our Ignite announcements that we had. Um, oh, we get, we're getting a question coming in. Thomas, can you talk a little bit about the unicast ring? I think um, Mega Man was not familiar with it. Right. So the unicast, so unicast as a um, as a networking technology is, you know, think of it, um, or there are different modes, right? There's there's um, 
<clears throat> unicast uh, uh, direct uh, connect where you speak to a specific IP address and there's broadcast. So you essentially speak to any address in the network. Um, and um, then the unicast is a specific address range in the IP protocol where you talk to specific ranges of addresses. So that helps us with the, um, you know, how do we how do we handle the traffic? So it's mainly for uh, load balancing scenarios. Uh, classically, in the past, uh, it was also used in the first initial, like how do you do like streaming sessions, right? This was uh, was done by unicast addresses, but now it's mainly used for global load balancing. So we do use that a lot, and others like um, you know other cloud providers also use that a lot for global load balancing. It does make the global load balancing much much easier. In the past, you had to worry about oh, let's say in North America, you had a you know uh, uh, a set of IP addresses versus in mm -hmm. Europe, you had another set of IP addresses, and then you need to bounce those either with like DNS round robin or DNS based uh, load load balancing versus in Unicast, it makes it easier. It's maybe a topic for a future session, like you know deep diving okay. on Unicast. Sounds good. Yeah, that's, that's before we drop. Good. I have a couple more teasers for our audience. So if you have a few more minutes, I'm happy oh, to yeah. share a little bit more. We definitely do. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Yeah. So there's this one more thing, right? So there was one one uh, famous person who who coined that <laughs> coined that phrase. So one more thing I have for you guys. So as I mentioned, so we keep improving the, the the service and the client specifically. So here's a little teaser of how the connection diagnostic is going to look like very soon. So we'll hopefully ship that uh, this year still. So. You know, keep an eye out of the uh, of the of the of the announcements that are coming. And um, as you see here, like we, we first of all we added more checks into the client checker and also make it much more you know appealing, and and you know following the the design standard of of uh, modern Windows. Uh, we also do you know improve a lot how you look into the policy. Remember, we looked into Visual Studio Code. You had to do the all the IP address translation. Well, look at that. The good news is we'll we'll do all that magic for you. You know, you don't have to do all this, you know, deep, uh, you know, touching on on the on the code. And also from the traffic acquisition or traffic capturing, uh, we will have also like um, you know um, um, a capturing capability, but also filtering. So you can already pre-filter that you don't need to to uh, um, you know do that post mortem. So you can do that while you are troubleshooting things uh, in your lab. So a lot of uh, cool things coming up, and we'll again like happy to hear your feedback. Um, if you know you miss some capabilities, you wanted to see something else, let me know or let us let the team know. We'll happy to hear it. Yeah, Thomas, that was excellent. I like how you did that little like one more thing. I mean, it's like we we're the show and you just did an encore. That's really cool. Nice teaser there. Um, I want to remind you folks, hey, for Ignite, which happened a few weeks ago, we did announce a lot of the Microsoft SSE internet access, um, private access preview um, capabilities that we released. A um, couple of them are all on our um, Microsoft uh, page, or enter page, but one of them are extending internet access capabilities, like being able to do context aware, SWG restrict end users to unsafe and non-compliant con content. So we added like web content filtering for URL, FQDN, and the web categories. We also did things like token theft protection for enter ID apps through compliant networks, check-in and conditional access. And then for private access capabilities, we released things like the UDP and private domain name server will enable seamless transition from traditional old VPN um, deployment to a fully ready identity centric um, ZTNA. Like I said, lots and lots of features and functionalities that we did. So if you missed our Ignite show, please check it out as well. But hey, that's all from us this week. We are so glad and excited that you joined us and spent some time with us this afternoon. Thomas, thank you a bunch. Um, Mark, thank you for being in the background, cheering and helping produce the show today. And for all you folks out there, have a great rest of your week and we'll see you next time. Like and subscribe. Thank you guys.